Welcome to Breaking Banks. We talk a lot about the cashless society on the show, but if you have any U.S. currency in your wallet right now, there's a good chance you have the signature of today's guest in the lower left corner of the bills. Rosie Rios was the 43rd treasurer of the United States, the longest serving Senate confirmed treasurer beginning with her time on the Treasury Federal Reserve transition team in November of 2008 at the height of the financial crisis until she left the post in July of 2016. She's now co-host of Unicorn Hunters, a business reality show on a mission to democratize access to wealth. And she was recently appointed to the board of directors for the blockchain company, Ripple. Rosie, welcome to the show. I want to talk about this bridging the gender investment gap and the need to democratize access to wealth. Uh, I, I'm sure you have a lot to say about that, but which, why is that so near and dear to your heart? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on here, JP. I'm thrilled to be here from sunny California. A lot happening in the world at the moment. And yes, I recently uh, joined the Bible, uh, in April. Thrilled to, to do that. Uh, for me, the concept of cryptocurrency has been out there for a while, and it, it took, for me, a legitimate path of utility that convinced me to join. So, uh, as you know, you know, the, crypto is in use widely, but for me, the, the XRP's role in facilitating cross-border payments very quickly, I think, provides an application that is much at the moment. You said an important word there around utility, and I, and I think you know with with the rise of multiple uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, a lot of them are a solution looking for a problem to have. So I I like the way that you frame that, and yeah, XRP is certainly um, interesting. So beyond cryptocurrency, I mean, what else do we need to do when we talk about democratizing wealth? Well, I think what 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 crypto does in general is it provides another option. And there are way too many people who don't have access to the traditional banking system. So especially using technology, using an innovative uh, ways to facilitate commerce, I think is really, really needed. So what I love about Unicorn Hunters is it provides a whole other option for Main Street to be able to participate in pre-IPO investments. And, and these are folks who otherwise would never be able to participate in the first place. So that's what I call democratizing access to potential wealth. Well, and, and you bring up a good point. It's not just about being able to transfer money uh, via cryptocurrency or, or store money, right? How do you have access to these kinds of investments? And 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 part of that too is you've, you've talked about right, the, the gender investment gap. And that's something you've worked on a long time. Um, we've been talking for quite a long time about um, putting the face of women on currency. And that's largely due to very hard work you've been doing for a long time. Maybe, maybe talk a little bit about that as some interesting history and, and how's that bring us up to where we are today? Sure, absolutely. Well, so you know, before coming into the administration as part of the treasury transition team in 2008, I was managing director of investments for a $22 billion firm based here in San Francisco. And when I got the call in October of 2008, when the sky was falling, uh, should Obama win in November of 2008, would I be interested in coming on board as a finance professional to help implement the legislation that Congress had just passed, the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, so that uh, when Obama takes office in January of 2009, we would hit the ground running. And so, you know, when you get that call, you can't really say no. So there I was, uh, literally in the in the, the storm, and it was during that time that I would take my break in Treasury's Historical Resource Center. And that's uh, when I realized, looking over all the historical financial products that Treasury had made, uh, so not just currency, but everything from postage stamps to military payment certificates to savings bonds. And it, 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 after a while, you notice a pattern. And, and what I noticed was that every image that was used on these products that included women weren't real women. They were allegorical women. So it was, uh, you know, Lady Liberties, sometimes with togas or sometimes without togas. But every male that I came across was a real man. It was a founding father, a, president, a cabinet member. And so if you look at how currency is used, it is a way to prove our history. So you will see on most currencies, on the front, you'll see a very important person. And on the back, you'll see a very significant edifice or monument. And so I realized by doing a little bit more homework that at that time, we had almost 30 women on their modern day currency. But 
not us. And in fact, when I asked around a little bit more, I realized that we had never had the portrait of a woman reserve notes in the history of our country. And so that became kind of my mission. I, I chose to come on board of, 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 the, of the transition folks who were recommended for appointment. I was with them. I chose to come on board and chose Treasury of the United States to work on this project. I also asked the secretary if I could chair the Advanced Counterfeit Deterrence Steering Committee. This is the only formal collaborative that exists between Secret Service, the Federal Reserve, and Treasury, specifically on monitoring our currency, but also currency design. And as the chair, I would be the one to make the recommendations to the Secretary of the Treasury, who, by the way, has a sole authority by law to redesign our nation's currency. So uh, I made that my party. Um, thankfully, Secretary Geithner was, was, was very supportive. And so here we are in 2021 and the journey still continues, but um, it's not all for naught. Um, you may or may not know that recently uh, with the support of Congress, we recently passed legislation to redesign our nation's quarters, the quarters in your that was passed by Congress in December, signed by the president in January. So in 2020, 2021, you will start seeing historical American women on your quarters, starting with Maya Angelou and Sally Rose. Very exciting. Well, that is very exciting. And having women represented on our currency is an important step. Yet there are many more left to take, right? Women are commonly left out of financial conversations and investment opportunities. And, um, you know, a lot of that is based on outdated stereotypes and bad information. The research actually shows women outperform men um, in investing and can make a significant impact on that, that change over the long term. So, I mean, what are the viable steps that we need to take to be able to close that gender gap when we talk about yeah. in investments? So that's my favorite question in the whole world. And so for me, this isn't just about currency. It's, it, it was kind of a, it, it was a trigger for me, right? It was a trigger of an, of an awakening that, uh, that, I, that I, I wasn't in before. And so if you would have known me, you know, 14 years ago, it's not like I didn't, I didn't, it's not like I didn't think these things weren't important. It just wasn't something on my mind. And so again, when you're kind of into a situation where you can notice some patterns and you, you know, people ask me, what's your, what's your superpower? My superpower is I can now see the invisible. I now know what's missing when it comes to women. And it's not just currency, it's statues, it's congressional gold medals. It's, it's, it, and it translates into this correlation, what I consider a correlation between visibility and value. Right, so we value what we see every day, but do we see what we value? And we're talking about 51% of the population, right? So it's so when it's 51% of the population, there's an equity component. We all have a stake in the outcome, right? So whether you're a mother, a father, you know, you know, whether it's your grandkids, your niece, your et cetera, we all have a stake in what happens to their future. I consider it a future leadership issue, but there's more to it than that. It kind of segues into my other priority, which is this concept of women and power. So when you think about the pillars of influence, right? Sex, money, power, well, no, it's women in position of money and power. When you start looking at the data, that gets kind of you know sad. This is where I'm gonna be the Debbie Downer for a second. So if you look at all the social, economic, and political indicators of where women are in terms of the, the power and the money that they hold, we kind of flatline at 20%, right? So it's whether it's mayors or governors or women in Congress, senators, uh, corporate boards, C-suites, that 20% flatline is the number. It's not my number, it's the number. And so I do think that if, if, if it, it's almost like a plain unconscious bias, in my opinion. So unconscious bias is when you don't realize that you're being influenced by something you're exposed to. My theory is, could it be that we're all being influenced by something we're not exposed to? And if we aren't at the forefront of what we value in our history, if we're not, you know, if women aren't valued at the forefront in these leadership positions of money and power where we know the influence lies, then yes, that is a future leadership issue. And your daughter, whether we like or not, your daughter, your niece, your granddaughter will be impacted. Well, and, and that's the difference between, you know, the vicious cycle and what can become a virtuous cycle, right? Uh, exactly what you say, exposure. When we have um, exposure, it normalizes things. And, and this certainly goes far beyond just uh, gender um, equality, right? And we, we have- No, absolutely. And, and, and I do think there's a very strange 
consciousness that doesn't exist in our country when it comes to 51% of your population. And I say 51%, look, if, if, if the US were 51% left-handed Lithuanians, that would be my focus right now. I'm saying that because again, when you feel like you have skin in the game, you wanna do something about it. And in all my educational initiatives, it's amazing. Most of my champions have been men with daughters. I know people hate when I say that, but it's true. And the truth is, if men are in 80% of the decision-making capacities, they have to be part of the solution. That's the only way change is gonna happen is when the decision to participate in the solution. Well, th th there's always sensitivity around that. We should do the right thing because it's the right thing, not because we have daughters or granddaughters or nieces or whatever, but- That is wishful thinking. <laughs> well, I was going to say, but um, I, I, I think, you know, empathy uh, comes from what we know. And, you know, I am uh, a middle-aged white male. And so, uh, I, you know, I do have the blind spots and the implicit biases. And so the closest I can get to empathy in some of these things are other people that I know in the way that they're impacted in that. So I, I don't disagree with you, but I, I just also recognize the need to, you know, go far beyond uh, this. And I, and I also recognize the practicality of 51%. That's an important number. And you know this this leads me kind of to something else you've talked and written about before this whole idea of uh, crowd financing, right? And and whether it's Robinhood or some of the other apps, um, they've been in the news lately. We've talked about them on the show. The you know the GameStop and and some of the other stocks that are going on. What's your current thought about you know where are we today in crowd financing and where do we need to go? What, what, what comes next? Yeah, so you know, this has been a discussion that's been around for a while. So let me just bring it back to 2011. So in 2011, when I was in Treasury, we hosted an Access to Capital conference. And the purpose of that conference was a realization that IPOs were not happening, right? Literally with the global financial crisis, things kind of came to a halt and raising money for any new venture was, was tough, it was tough. And so that purpose of that particular conference was to get kind of the, the big thinkers in the room and figure out what to do. Well, that led to the formation of a task force that ended up making the recommendations to Congress that led to the passage of the Jobs Act of 2012, the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act. And as you know, that contained the provisions of crowdfunding, eventually uh, finalized by the SEC not that long ago, that led to the ability for a show like Unicorn Hunters to even be around. So again, the concept of, of, of providing that capability of having Main Street participate in this, these crowdfunding opportunities, and again, that otherwise they wouldn't be able to, was a big kind of coup for the administration, but really a coup for those investors and many of them female founders, I mean, excuse me, uh, for those founders, many of them female founders who, who you know, have been left out of the system completely. It's actually sad, you probably, you know, uh, in Fortune magazine, they recently had the article that said that in 2020, $150 billion uh, was invested by, by ECs and only 2.2% were, were women founded companies. And, you know, the, the, the sad part is that was a decrease from 2019, which is 2.6%. So a lot more needs to be done, in my opinion. So it's, it, it, it's not just the what, it's also the how. And so going back to my, you know, my, my role as an accidental feminist, we have to be very kind of, you know, conscious and then conscientious. It's like being, being, you know, um, aware and then, and then taking action, right? So awareness and action, being conscious and then conscientious. And so it's not just about, you know, how to get more money to companies and how to allow more investors to participate. But it's also, in my opinion, a very deliberate and thoughtful approach to getting more female founders uh, on the rails, literally on the rails. Well, we've had conversations on the show recently, too, about the, that same gap in VC funding, uh, right? Not enough going to founders of color and the female founders and, uh, again, all the implicit biases around all that. So the job well, Yeah, Act I mean, when you talk about... When you talk about uh, people of color, here's the sad part is even a rounding error, right? I mean, you know, that's when I call it, it's not the glass ceiling uh, for women and people of color, it's a glass wall, 
Right. right? And so my goal is to, to get in the building, much less in the room. Right. So it's a big step forward. Well, and, and that's what I was going to say that the Jobs Act uh, definitely was a step in that direction, removed some of the barriers. I mean, what else do we need to do structurally? Uh, and then I want to talk about uh, Unicron Hunters. What are, what are you doing about it specifically? But um, we, let's stay at the high level for a moment. You know, what, what comes next after the Jobs Act? What, what other barriers do we need to bring down structurally? Well, I think the, the, the good news about kind of structure is, you know, there's a, obviously a regulatory framework that's in place. We have a new administration. We have a lot of great people at the helm having a lot of great conversations about what happens to, to inspire innovation, not stymie innovation. And so, you know, I, I adore Gary Gensler. I think he's going to do a fabulous job in, in, you know, not just in the crowdfunding space, but in the crypto space and all the other areas where I think you need level-headed people who have been in the trenches. You know, he was obviously the chair of the CFTC in the past. He, he knows crypto, he was at MIT studying this. And so he, in my opinion, uh, you know, obviously in the Obama administration, he, he was also part of the, the Jobs Act legislation among other pieces of legislation. So the regulatory framework that needs to be in place is really just beginning, in my opinion. Those discussions are happening now. And, and, and so you see a lot of, you know, you, of course you saw the news about, for example, El Salvador uh, passing a law to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. That's a huge, huge step. So having the government, the regulators, literally kind of, you know, trying to get ahead of this, which is really hard because, gov you know, government doesn't usually lead. They usually follow, right? So they react. They react to, to innovations that, you know, are happening in the private sector. So uh, I do think that in this administration, you do have a lot of good people at the helm starting the conversations that needed to be started. Well, and building on that thought that, um, you know, government and regulation kinds of follows the private sector. So you're part of an exciting business reality show, Unicorn Hunters. Tell us about the show, tell us about the structure, and tell us about some of the things that you're seeing on the show. Yeah, so Unicorn Hunters is a platform that's on a mission to democratize creation, uh, wealth creation and access to capital. And so it, it, uh, I'm a member of the Circle of Money. I'm a panelist. And we have pre-IPO companies looking for their next 20 to $50 million on their way to becoming a billion dollar company, which is a unicorn. They in, they make their presentations. We grill them with questions. We talk about it amongst ourselves. And then we decide if we would commit to investing in them. And then the, the audience has the ability to also invest in them as well by going through the website. So are you literally putting your own money into this? Absolutely. Are you kidding? Yes. And, and it has to be something that I believe in. So, so uh, you know, I came from the investment world. I know the questions to ask. Now, it's hard to make a, you know, a decision in a 26-minute show. Right. But I always, you know, on, on the website, you will see the prospectus, the private placement memorandum, the additional information that anyone should should absolutely go take a look at. And so, you know, look, I mean, Robin Hood did for stocks in terms of kind of opening the door for folks to be able to kind of own their own future in a very creative way. And so I'd like to think that Unicorn Hunters will do the same thing for pre-IPOs. And again, there's a kind of a, a double, uh, double benefit here. So again, the companies who wouldn't have had access to that capital and for the investors who wouldn't have access to that pre-IPO opportunity. Interesting. Um, so, so what are some of the most interesting companies that you've seen come through Unicorn Hunters so far? Yeah, well, what I love about this is you know, these are these are game changing ideas. We're not just looking for the next big backpack. I mean, these are you know cancer treatments. These are you know new ultraviolet treatments to eradicate bacteria that could lead to another COVID. You know, these are are are, are just really kind of, in my opinion, very very innovative, seasoned people who had been uh, working in big leadership positions who decided to pursue their own passions. And so, uh, you know, to be part of that, to be able to, to get to know them a little bit more has been just thrilling. And of course, you know, anytime there's a female founder, I, I just get that much more excited to think that, you know, they're gonna lead the charge. Yeah, um, no, that's it's really interesting. And, and how, um, how are you seeing the public response to that, the, the public ability to invest in those companies? 
Yeah, it's been great. It's been really great. I, I haven't seen the latest numbers, but from what I understand, the companies are definitely raising money. And you know, there's obviously a process you need to go through if you want to be an accredited investor versus a non-accredited investor. And so as people visit the website and find out more information, again, you go through the process. You know, I had my my neighbor next door, she was so excited. She said that was a no-brainer. Of course I was going to do that. That was on the first episode, which was really, again, just great to hear that feedback. I've been asking for feedback from 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 everyone I know just to kind of you know, this is, this is different. It's a very novel approach, but it could very well be a game changer. And look, and then it's fun. I mean, who doesn't want to be sitting next to you know, Steve Wozniak uh, and then, you know, Lance Bass. And I mean, just, these are great people. And I got to tell you, the these are the energy, other panelists in the circle of money. These are the other right, panelists. So. These are, they're part of the circle of money and the energy that we have among the group is authentic. So, you know, it's unscripted, by the way. This is all unscripted. We don't know what's coming. We get these presentations and then we were literally on the fly to come up with the right answer. No, there's no right or wrong, but we need to come up with the questions that we think are the ones that we would ask as real investors. How are your questions maybe different from some of the other panelists on there? What are the things that you like to look well, for? Yeah, well, I'm a trained analyst. Right? So my first job out of college was as a commercial property underwriter for general reinsurance. So there's a very, very, very specific way of thinking that I you know, have been trained in. It's kind of ingrained in my head. So, you know, for anyone who's looking at anything, the way I would approach it is, you know, existing conditions, uh, case study, precedent, uh, uh, you know, recommendation, implementation, right? So it's a very, very specific train of thought. So I'm going to ask that founder, right? So one of the questions I asked, for example, is there was a founder that was looking for $20 million. And I said, oh, great, what if you get 40? What's that next $20 million going to be used for? Because you want to know how they're thinking about their own priorities, right? So yeah. maybe they're going to use that next $20 million to scale their production. Okay, but the next 20 is going to be for what? Right? They're going to hire more staff to think about more distribution points. They're going to go global, blah, 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 blah. Right? So for me, how are they thinking about their own priorities how are, you know, what's their exit strategy? Who are their investors? Uh, how much debt do they have? Uh, why did they do this in the first place? What was their inspiration? Is there a personal story behind this? What's your team look like? You know, where are you going to be in five years? You know, these are, these are pretty much questions that I would want to know if I, again, as, as, a, as a potential investor, but I also, I think all of us bring a different perspective to the table. So Lance, for example, is already an investor in his own projects, right? So he, you know, he owns restaurants, he's opening a club, he's going to open up a, a grocery store. He has this other fund that he runs with another colleague. So he's already kind of the very active casual investor. And obviously, Steve Wozniak has been in the trenches and then some, he's the godfather of Silicon Valley. So his questions are, you know, obviously going to be literally coming from his own, own experience as an entrepreneur, as a founder. So everyone has a different perspective. And I think, again, we mesh really well with that, 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 the diversity of thought. Well, and there are different questions that are more relevant at different stages of companies' growth too, right? Whether it's early stage, mid stage, growth stage, later stage. And so it sounds like the, the panel's able to kind of really cover all of the above with their different perspectives. Absolutely. And although most of these companies, again, are you know on their path of right. eventually- They're not real early stage. In, 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 right. That's right. That's right. They're, they they want to go public in the next, you know, year or two. Right. So so th that's why your kind of traditional analyst questions are relevant because you're you're really in a scaling stage um, for them. Well, absolutely. Uh, and you want to know that they're up to the task, right? You're 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 literally you're you're, you're analyzing the company, but you're analyzing the CEO. Well, where can people find out more and watch the show and and look at the companies that you're you're looking at? Yeah, unicornhunters.com. So it's on the website. Uh, there's been a, an enormous amount of interest. I, I usually am not a social media junkie, but my social media has been exploding. Uh, and I feel like I need to keep with it now. Um, but it's, it's amazing the feedback that we've been getting. And, and as I said, I've been reaching out to, to everyone I know to get constructive feedback on what we need to think about. You know, there will be a season two, there will be a season three. And so as we as we think about that pipeline of opportunity, I'm also very active in, in thinking about where we can find, again, you know, more, more female founders. That is absolutely my priority. 
Well, that's exciting as, as we think about um, expanding opportunities and, and expanding them for everyone. And, and that's certainly uh, something that's important to us on the show. So a, any, any last uh, thoughts or anything you, you want our listeners to know? Um, no, I, 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 this, I think the one thing that, that is such a personal takeaway for me is that here I am, you know, sitting in that Access to Capital conference in 2011 that led to the Jobs Act of 2012 that ultimately, you know, here I am 10 years from that conference implementing the spirit of the Jobs Act. So it all comes full circle. So I guess the, the takeaway from that is follow your heart. You just never know where these great passions are going to lead you. And if you'd have asked me 10 years ago if I'd be doing a reality series based on legislation that was passed, I, I, I wouldn't have believed you. So here it is. Life is possible in, in a very wonderful way. Well, thanks for your leadership on all of the above. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you, JP. Let's talk about fees, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good things and the bad things that may be. All right, so we're not exactly the next salt and pepper, but joining me today is Jason McCullough, publisher of FinTech Business Weekly. And if you don't subscribe, do you even work in FinTech? Jason, welcome to Breaking Banks. We've been talking about this on Twitter for far too long. I'm glad we finally made it happen. Yeah, as am I. And uh, thank you for that that very generous intro. Yeah, sorry you had to suffer through that. I probably should have warned you that was coming. Um, you know, kind of like, you know, the iconic salt and pepper, let's talk about sex. Fees and their role in income statements on the financial in industry aren't often talked about. That is until, of course, the Financial Health Network released its 2021 FinHealth spend report. And there were some startling data in there. Financially struggling households spent $255 billion on fees, interest related to everyday financial services. And that's compared to $47 billion that financially healthy households spent. Now, overdraft fees accounted for a record high of $30 billion across the industry, with the average fee for transgression reaching a new height of almost $35. Bucks. According to a recent survey, that was by Bankrate. Now, this is up from a total of $11 billion the year before. And overdraft fees can account for 5 to 7% of total revenue. We're talking a billion dollars each of the big banks pulling in for overdraft fees. It's the dominant share of non-interest income. And that makes the announcement from Ally Bank quite surprising that they're going to discontinue charging overdrafts. Jason, you wrote some great uh, pieces around this. And I'm curious about your take on this move. You know, what, What's Ally thinking? It might be in the best interest of consumers, but you know, the numbers show banks aren't necessarily operating in the best interest of consumers with the amount of money they've made to date. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, Ally's move is a strong one, but in some regards, it may be more about messaging and positioning than it necessarily is about giving up revenue. I mean, their consumer base tends to be a little bit more affluent and thus Know, less likely to overdraft. But you have seen other banks, uh, other legacy incumbent banks, whatever term you prefer, make moves to help consumers reduce the likelihood of overdrafting. Um, I think there's a couple of different things that are driving this. My suspicion is the strongest one is uh, increased attention from legislators and from the regulatory apparatus, right? So obviously, you know, there was election back in November, you may have heard, yeah. um, and a change of administration uh, and changing control of the Senate. And that has, you know, that has, what is the phrase? Elections have consequences. Um, uh, on the other hand, there are also, you know, a slew of uh, challenger banks, neo banks, whatever term you prefer, that are slowly but steadily growing their share of users who are primarily defecting from these, you know, big legacy banks where they incurred those overdraft, NSF, minimum balance fees that you talked about. Yeah, but the, the neos and challengers themselves have also historically not, you know, looked the best when it comes to overdraft fees. Now it's changing a little bit. You know, you have Chime in their spot me feature in terms of, you know, as long as you're getting direct deposit, I think it's up to two hundred dollars will be covered, you know, without a fee. You know, so that's beginning to evolve. But kind of industry wide, you know, overdraft sits at a really interesting, you know, kind of place in terms of its dependence. And, you know, you had sent me, you know, even just this morning in American Banker, there's two other large institutions that don't necessarily 
have the same customer base of an ally, you know, are considering it, which I guess is different than saying they're doing it. Uh, well, and in, in what's interesting, I, I think I sent that to you before I read it myself. So uh, m- my bad on that. If you actually dig into that article, it was regions and citizens, which are two sort of mid-sized regional banks, and they're not considering, you know, doing away with overdrafts. And actually, there are two banks that uh, derive a significant portion of their non-interest income from those fees. It was like 17% and 12%. I don't remember which is which, uh, but pretty high compared to their peer set in the banking world. And what uh, the piece said was, I believe Regions is considering or is planning on reordering how they process transactions so that credits uh, are processed before debits. And, you know, the somewhat tongue-in-cheek comment I made about this uh, was that it really feels a bit like too little, too late. Yeah. So it's like, oh, okay, you're going to stop tra- uh, processing transactions in a way that intentionally uh, causes your customers to incur overdrafts. That's a good but very small step to doing right by your customers. Well, I mean, is it even doing right by your customers or is it, you know, in, in the face of scrutiny, I'm going to come clean faster, you know, than you find out what I've done. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I'm, well, no, I'm not sympathetic, but I think these regional banks are feeling the pressures on all sides. You know, you have the mega behemoths, of uh, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Bank of America. You have, you know, the upstart, challenger banks like Vero and Chime, these regionals are kind of struggling to understand, you know, where do they fit and how do they survive in this rapidly changing landscape? And moves like, you know, potentially doing away with overdraft fees, you know, that's a a source of revenue that, you know, they're dependent on and their shareholders certainly care about. So I can understand the reluctance to give this up before they understand, you know, what what is coming next to drive their business forward. But if they just sort of stand still, like they will see their lunch get eaten eventually, sooner well, rather than later. It could be in a catastrophic sense, right? Like if it becomes legislated to change, that's a big, you know, hole punched in the bow of the boat. You know, and there's another one related to this. If you look at what else from a net interest margin are banks dependent on, interchange, right? Like interchange mm-hmm. makes up a substantial form right after um, fees for the net interest margin that is not related, you know, to interest. And, you know, if you look at, couldn't find exact numbers on it, but what I did find from SP global is if it's more than 3% of the total, you have to report and well north of 60% of banks, it's more than 3%, right? And so Mm -hmm. if you look at what interchange begins to, um, apply in terms of your dependence, you know, let's, play this out, if overdraft fees go away and interchange continues to have pressure, what does the business model of the future look like, especially for the startups that are dependent on this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a great question. I, if you, and I was not necessarily paying a ton of attention when like Durban amendment was happening, you know, back post 2008. I read it cover to cover in case you're wondering, because that was during the launch of Perk Street and we were dependent on interchange, right? Interchange and the idea that community banks would pay us for our deposits. And so when the federal funds rate goes to zero, talk about a, a, a giant hole in your revenue model is no one wants to pay you for deposits. It was all about the interchange. And, and that makes sense, right? So if I am to in, infer the intention of that amendment or that legislation, it was to give small banks below $10 billion in assets a, uh, a leg to stand on, so to speak, that these larger banks you know, arguably didn't need. Now, that's clearly not exactly how that uh, amendment has played out, right? Certainly your Sutton and Bank Corp kind of banks are deriving some revenue uh, from that carve out. Uh, but what it has really enabled is the business models of companies like Chime, Vero, Money Lion, Dave, et cetera. I'm not saying that's a, a good or bad thing. I'm just saying if you look at the, uh, the likely intent when that was proposed and passed versus the impact on the market, it's, it, it hasn't played out exactly how I imagine uh, Dick Durbin, the senator from my home state, uh, probably you know, imagined that it would. 
Yeah. So you've dug into the the recent SPACs and, you know, around this. I'm curious on your take, when you look at, you know, what they're putting together as a revenue model, you know, are there real businesses in there or is this a momentum play right now? So I, to some extent, that question uh, remains to be answered, right? Like I would love to see Chimes Financials or Veros Financials. Uh, unfortunately, they're you know they're not at the stage yet where they've decided to go public. Looking at some of the challenger banks who are going through that SPAC process, specifically Money Lion and Dave, there are a couple of points in there that um, I find interesting, concerning. Um, yeah, the interchange is is a core part of their revenue model, and I don't I don't foresee that uh, changing in the near future. But to your earlier point, you know, so many companies are making that play right now, and so it's about a uh, battle for capturing the direct deposit and then capturing the consumer spending that through your debit card. Um, the areas that I think are a little more um, at risk are money line days dependence on expedited funding fees. And so yeah. that's where, okay, if I'm giving you a, a cash advance and you're not using my, you know, Dave's debit card, money lines, debit card, I'm going to charge you a, a fairly high fee on a percent basis to get that money faster. Um, and there's a number of like regulatory issues that could come up around that. Um, which we can unpack if you want to. And then on the other side, you know, the entire tipping model. So there's already been some scrutiny around that with, I believe it was Earnin in the um, earned wage advance space because they were tying the amount somebody qualified for to how much they were tipping. It's a big no-no. Um, but even the practice of tipping in general. So Dave defaults users to 10%. So if you're getting a $100 advance, Dave is suggesting that you pay them ten dollars. Uh, I can't do that math in my head, but on an APR basis, it becomes very comparable to you know the big boogeyman uh, of you know five or ten years ago, payday loans. Yep. Um, and uh, Money Lion has already received something like five different requests for information from the CFPB, uh, the SEC the state of California, Colorado, and Minnesota. So, you know, there's no there's no clear answer here. I don't know what those investigations are about, but but there are clearly questions being asked about some of the business practices and some of the business models these companies are uh, employing. Well, and, it, you know, again, back to the loopholes that can be employed, you know, traditional banks, I don't think would ever dare say, you know, explain to their examiner, oh, we've got this tipping, you know, and, and call it a feature, right? That, that's what I found interesting in, you know, describing tipping as a feature, which is really a fee, right? With a horrendous uh, APR associated with it. You know, e you know, is there going to be another reckoning for these companies that recently, you know, go public as a SPAC or, you know, as they're raising the next monster round that they look at and say, hmm, you know, just as the banks are saying, we might want to come clean before it you know, becomes an issue, are they themselves probably going to need to rethink some of those business practices? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it's entirely possible depending on, on what happens in the regulatory environment. You know, and that could be something that happens at the federal level or, you know, and or it could be something that happens at the state level. You know, there are uh, states that are more aggressive, you know, particularly New York, um, Massachusetts, California, Illinois, where, you know, if they say, oh, okay, this tip is a finance charge, you need to display it as an APR. And oh, by the way, you know, Illinois, for example, you know, pretty much bans any loan above 36%. Um, or, you know, the uh, Military Lending Act, which is one of the areas that Moneyline is being probed for, prohibits lending to members of the military or their families at rates above 36%. And you need to have mechanisms in place to make sure that you're not doing that. Uh, so I think there's there's a lot of different ways you know this could go, and, and clearly it's a topic that already has the attention of a lot of folks in the regulatory sphere. Yeah, and one of the things that this you know, sparks for me is if we look at a lot of the innovation. So much of it has been around 
you know, things that are real and meaningful around the user experience and, you know, not just making it a prettier digital interface, but actually changing the way it works. But we haven't seen enough, at least in a positive sense, of the business model innovation, right? And unless I'm missing it, have you seen something you look at and say, might not have it totally figured out yet, but like there's the interesting twist on you know, how you make money? Well, I think that's right. Um, I mean, a lot of companies that we're, you know, that we're seeing or that we're talking about now are highly dependent on interchange. Now, to... To contrast that, right? I um, I live in the Netherlands. Uh, interchange is more or less not a thing here, and I would sort of argue that as a result, there's significantly less, uh, there are significantly fewer companies in the consumer segment that are doing the kinds of things that Chime, Vero, even Moneyline or Dave are doing, because the the revenue is not there. Um, I mean, there's a handful. There's you know, Bunk here in in the Netherlands, uh, but I'm positive that you know it is not profitable because they do no lending and there's no money in interchange, so they have a monthly subscription fee, and that's about it. And what do you get for the monthly subscription? Uh, it's basically a vanilla neo bank. You know, I have a, a debit card. I get direct deposit, or well, direct deposit from uh, you know my payroll, um, and, and frankly, not even a very polished UX. Um, I think N26 is also available here, uh, which I believe is less expensive or possibly free. But the value proposition, honestly, like in this country, is not really there because you can go to AB, you can go to ABN AMRO or ING, get a similar functional account for lower cost. For me, the benefit was ease of onboarding as a foreign national. Mm, yes, it, you know when stickiness is the onboarding, but over time that should also get you know better as well, uh, in theory. But I think you know the point that I'd love to draw out related to this is the innovation that we need to be thinking about needs to be in a forward looking as opposed to the oh this is how the industry historically has made money you know let's tweak that a little bit you know let's add tipping which as you pointed out is not really you know, um, anything more than a finance charge or buy now, pay later. Well, that's really a form of lending, right? You know, restructured slightly, repackaged, feels different, but it's point of sale lending. Um, mm -hmm. Who do you track that you think is making the most interesting strides around, you know, macro reinvention of how financial services are delivered? Oh, that is a, that is a tough question and not, not what I prepared for. Um, I mean, I think if, off the top of my head, a couple of companies I think are doing interesting things. Um, you know, Bridget is largely, you know, offers a largely similar product to Dave and Money Lion. Their um, unique take on it is that there's a subscription fee per month, whether or not you use the product. And the argument, and I've I've had a chance to connect and talk with the CEO and interviewed him, you know, a number of months back. The argument that they make is basically, you know, this better aligns our interest with the consumer. We're not incentivizing them to over borrow or borrow more frequently because the amount of money we get is the same no matter what. So that's not necessarily like a wholesale reinvention of the business model, but an incremental step to trying to sort of solve some of the mismatches between, you know, bank or fintech uh, incentive and, you know, customer outcome. Yeah. You know, without naming names, because I don't know that some of them are public, but where I find the interesting theme is when you see a player, whether it's an incumbent or it's a startup, has rebuilt their stack so that their mm -hmm. fundamental um, cost structure looks so different. You know, mm -hmm. one of the challenger banks, the reason that as much as they espouse like a super low CAC and a very high LTV, having looked at the numbers, the reason the LTV is as high as it is, if I can get off of the traditional cost structure, mm -hmm. I don't need to get a whole lot of interchange to actually have a profitable customer. And I, and I think that makes sense, right? I mean, the, the classic argument, you know, whether it's the company you're referencing or the Chimes and Barrows is, you know, you know, no branches, you know, no salespeople, uh, digital app-based delivery. And these, these are real and very expensive cost structures that are tied to, you know, incumbent banks. And if you look at, 
you know, if you look at the the data, and FDIC does a really good survey on this of, you know, what do people really care about or what's preventing people from opening a bank account? It's actually not branches, right? The whole idea of a bank desert. Um, actually probably applies more to rural America than it does urban. But even then, that's not the number one thing that's you know stopping somebody from opening a traditional bank account. It's that they feel like they don't have enough money to do it or that the fees at a Fifth Third or JPM, uh, the fees are too high to make it worthwhile to them. Yeah. Or they're cash-based, right? Like the one thing you really do need the branch for. But, you know, I think – both Ron Shevlin and Jim Marus make a great point of this in a lot of the research they publish is you know, the banks that hide behind customers love opening a, an account in our branch. What they're really saying is your online account opening process is so miserable. I'd rather, you know, hike to the branch because that is less pain th- than doing it. Not that we enjoy the branch visit. Well, in, in the inexorable, you know, medium long-term trend is that branches, you know, 99% of branches go away, right? Like I'm sure there is a certain segment of the population that is, you know, tech averse and they really want to go into their credit union or to their local small town bank to do whatever they need to do. But that is a rapidly shrinking, you know, minority of the population. And, you know, banks are, Particularly, actually, the you know, mid-sized regional banks we mentioned earlier uh, are struggling with how to right-size the cost structure and modernize their delivery, you know, web, uh, mobile, et cetera. Yeah. Well, and related, so if cash is one of the reasons that um, people need to go in, especially small businesses that deal in that, it, you know, if in the U.S., the federal government actually does put out a stable coin, a digital stable coin, Mm -hmm. a real electronic fiat currency. And while many banks fear that, it also creates a huge opportunity, right? Because if I no longer am dependent on cash uh, to keep a branch structure alive, do I also have the opportunity to completely replumb? Now, that's a bold move if someone's willing to do it. And I actually can operate more like, you know, that fintech startup that has the cost advantage. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I mean, I wrote a a short thing about the uh, Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, which was the first currency union to launch a stablecoin-based currency. Um, And, you know, I actually used to live in the Eastern Caribbean in St. Lucia, and there was no ATM or bank in the village I lived in. You know, I had to hitchhike to the next village over, withdraw cash, and then go pay my bills in person. So if something like a central bank digital currency, which is admittedly like slightly different than the stable coin you're talking about, but but conceptually close, um, can solve those kinds of problems in you know a place like the Eastern Caribbean, it should also be able to solve those kinds of problems in a place like the United States. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we are just about out of time. Personal curiosity. Of all of the pieces that you have written so far, what is your personal favorite or the one you point to that you say, this is my baby, this is the one I'm most proud of? Uh, I'll answer that in two parts. Uh, everyone is still obsessed with buy now, pay later, uh, and, and that tends to like resonate really well. While I have a certain amount of interest in that sector because it is so uh, impactful and, and trendy at the moment. I'm kind of like a stats and data nerd at heart. So there's a couple I did based on FDIC data and then actually based on a survey panel I ran myself around how consumers are actually using fintech and using banking apps. And those are probably the two that I'm personally the most proud of. Well, everyone should be checking that out at FinTech Business Weekly. It is one of my favorite things. You know, I'd say it Sunday mornings, I'm like looking with great anticipation for what you've published on now and almost without fail, like something I'd plan to either write on or do a show on between you, Ron, Jim, and Theo. It's kind of like, I'm just going to give up in kind of content. You guys do it better and faster than I ever could. I think, you know, uh, don't give up. It's not a zero sum game. The more people, you know, thinking, writing, podcasting in the space, I think the better. Well, I'm going to go just pivot to rapping. That's what I'm going to (laughs) do. Now, take it back. Chris Skinner has actually been doing the most phenomenal job of fintech focused covers uh, of the classics. So even that space is taken for me. (laughs) 
<laughs> Thanks for joining, especially uh, across the pond, Jason. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for this week. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform or share it with a friend or share it on social media. We'll see you again next week with more Breaking Banks.